It is Friday, July 30th. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about from this past week, so let's dive right in. First up, as always, our PS Plus reminder. Make sure you grab the July games before they go away. August 3rd, it will change over to Tennis World Tour 2. Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Naperville, and Hunter's Arena Legends, which that one we knew about from the last day to play, and that's going to be a PS4 and PS5 benefit, so if you're only on PS4 right now, then you've got three games in this lineup, which that's maybe the, the best silver lining thing that we can look at here. I mean, it's kind of an underwhelming month. I can see where, you know, people are a bit disappointed, um, but you might want to try Hunter's Arena because that's uh, that was just in beta not that long ago. It seems like there were some positive thoughts there, so... It's accessible, it's going to be free with your membership, at least jump in and give that a shot and hopefully September looks much better. Now getting into our first news story, if you remember a few months ago we talked about how Sony was opening up the beta program on PS5 for testing system software updates like they did on PS4 and it turns out just yesterday all the invites went out for this first wave of testing the next major system software update on PS5 and so we have an idea of all the changes and features and quality of life improvements that are coming in the next public wide release and there is a ton to go over so a lot of major things that people have been requesting for a while here and we're going to go over the entire change log so this doesn't guarantee that all these features will be present on the the public release but as of right now this is what people are testing and discovering here's the entire change log so starting off 3d audio is now available through standard tv speakers this is ready to turn on in the settings menu and the dual sense microphone will be used to measure the acoustics of your room to apply the best 3d audio setting now if you remember this was part of the ps5 roadmap of features uh, back when mark cerny talked about this in the 3d audio segment for the road to ps5 we knew this was coming eventually now it's going to be here very soon this is for standard tv speakers so not sound bars or uh, multi-channel setups but that should be coming after this. Next up, there's new prominent icons on the home screen to distinguish PS4 and PS5 games, and if you have a game with both the PS4 and PS5 version installed, they'll appear separately on the home screen now instead of that drop-down menu where you'd have to select the version that way. So this should remedy any cross-generation confusion or having a PS4 version installed that you didn't want to or playing the, the wrong version of a game. This should rectify that. In the library, the installed tab is now the first thing you'll see, which we already had this changed server side, so I'm not sure why this is in the change log. The install tab will have those big PS4 and PS5 platform labels on there as well with the complete separation if they're the same game. In the collection tab, games will display the total number of versions available to you if you're entitled to multiple versions of a game. This might be handy if you have a huge collection and you're just not keeping up with game news so you might have missed the fact that one of your games now has a PS5 upgrade for free or something like that. I'd imagine that's how that's going to work. You can also hide games more quickly. And then from game base, you can now access messages and send them from the game base menu in the control center. If you are the party owner, you can delete it from game base and that will delete it for all the other members as well. Under the friends tab, you'll now see how many are online, busy or offline. You can now accept, decline or cancel multiple friend requests at the same time. For trophies, you can now track up to five trophies per game in the control center using the tracker. And when playing a game, you can easily access information about the trophies you've chosen to track. And you can pin the tracker to the side of the screen during gameplay. When viewing trophies, the trophies will now be displayed vertically, and that is a much requested feature. I am so glad that's finally here. You'll now be able to see more information without having to click into each individual trophy. You can now rearrange the control center icons in whatever order you want. There will also be an introduction to the control center features when you first open it. There's new shortcuts for the screen reader. Press the PS button and triangle at the same time to pause or resume it. Press the PS button and R1 to have it repeat what it last read. There's a new accolade type called Leader. This is for a player who crafts the plan, strategizes, or inspires others. Now, I'm not sure how often people are really using accolades nowadays, but there's a new type that you can start using or maybe receiving. For PlayStation Now, the streaming connection test lets you identify and fix problems with your connection. I'm not sure how this is going to help you troubleshoot that, but that's in there. You can set your max streaming resolution, so being able to set it from 720 to 1080 where applicable. If a game has an expiration date, a part of PS Now, you'll see that date in the game's hub screen. So if you're actively playing it, then every time you start it, you'll be reminded of when that game is leaving the service. When competing in challenges for a better time or score, a video clip of that action is taken for you, and you'll be able to share that clip directly from a new challenge card in the control center or from the media gallery later. This feature can also be adjusted in settings or presumably turned off entirely. 
The control center will offer suggestions if a friend is playing a game you can join. Before, this option would take longer to appear for recently added friends, and the suggestion will also work if that friend is streaming it via PS Now. For parental controls, when a child requests to play a game or use a communication feature, the parent or guardian will receive a notification on PS5 or the mobile app, and then the request can be accepted or denied from there. In Media Gallery, there's new fonts for the text you can add to screenshots. There's new options in the Create menu. When manually recording a clip, the elapsed time counter will disappear or reappear as needed. There's more video lengths to choose from. You can also enable or disable save confirmation notifications, and you can also select if you'd like notifications on PS5 or by email for new products and special offers from Sony. For notifications, if there is a video in them, you can start the video right there from the pop-up or from the notification list. You can also toggle notification sounds on or off. When you log in with a microphone accessory connected, the mute status is displayed. There's a more simplified process now for connecting, disconnecting, or setting up an internet connection. When adjusting 3D audio profiles, you can now move the same sound from left to right manually to make a more informed choice on your 3D audio profile. There is improved game audio quality for some games with 3D audio when you're using headphones. There's audio EQ presets now in the control center if you have the Pulse 3D wireless headset. When you block someone, you'll also have the option to leave all parties where that user also is. There's two separate controls now for including your mic's audio and party audio into your broadcasts, and these are also available for video clips. There's a new update for DualSense controllers, which now you can manually update them if you want to from settings. And last, but definitely not least, SSD expansion is now available. So we can talk about this for our next story because Sony actually outlined a number of things regarding expanding your storage on PS5. This is a highly requested feature that many have been waiting for since day one. We knew it was coming. Uh, the rumor was around summertime and at least for the beta phase, that is true. Although I imagine this uh, wide public release, which all these features we talked about, this is all in the beta phase, so it's not available just yet, but I imagine these are going to come um, sometime this autumn, right? So it's not going to be too much longer until this is available, but we can go over all the guidelines that Sony set out for what it looks like to expand your storage on PS5. And it's kind of the things that we already expected, but as a quick recap, the expansion slot is for M.2 SSDs. They need to be PCIe 4.0 with a minimum capacity of 250 gigabytes up to four terabytes. Uh, make sure your PS5 is off when removing or installing one. Once installed and you turn on your PS5, you'll see a screen telling you if it's compatible or not, then it will format it for use. And when it's installed, it acts as a separate directory like external storage, so you can manually move games to it or start installing them from there. And this is where PS5 games will be playable. In terms of compatible drives, so there were no exact models that Sony listed. Right now, it's kind of a, a preview program where not only are people testing them on their own, but Sony has outlined the specifications. So 22 millimeter width, read speeds of 5,500 megabytes per second or faster. A heatsink isn't really a recommendation here. It's more of a, what Sony's calling a requirement for effective heat dissipation. And in this example footage that I'm showing you, we've had this since launch, but I'm installing a Western Digital SN850. This is one of the few drives where we know it should be compatible on paper and it does not have a heatsink. You can buy one with or without it. And if you do end up buying a drive without a heatsink, you can just buy a heatsink separately for $15, $20. You just have to make sure that it fits properly in the small little expansion slot. And that's what's problematic about how this happened yesterday when Sony outlined this because uh, I'm surprised how much discourse there was surrounding it. But I mean, we knew a lot of this going into it. It's just that, well, it's coming off as not very consumer friendly or not very elegant or easy when you have Microsoft offering a slightly little proprietary, you know, SSD memory card where it's plug and play. And that is definitely much easier. And that's not even completely a proprietary because Microsoft will open that up to other manufacturers eventually. So hopefully a good open market starts there, but there's that. And then there is just, you know, Sony's wording, it comes off as more restricted than it actually is, but they do this a lot with their services, features, initiatives, where there's a lot of liability baked into how they presented this when they say, oh, it has to be exactly this. And, you know, the experience may be different from games installed internally, but, you know, give it a year or two and you're going to have a pretty healthy open market of drives with a good price to gigabyte ratio. They're smaller, the heat sinks are smaller, and you, you won't have to think as much about which drive you end up buying because Sony did pick an industry standard. That was the great thing about PS3 and 4 and now 5 where you can use a third-party drive and 
um, really the installation process is easier here because you're expanding instead of replacing. So for PS3 and 4, the huge pain there was you had to reinstall system software. So many people got that mixed up. Um, but here, you just plug it in, it's gonna format the drive and you'll be ready to go. So, I mean, really, it's just, uh, it's kind of a set it and forget it thing. But I will caution, the longer you wait, the better because you will have more affordable drives. The going rate right now is expensive, about 200 something plus dollars USD for one terabyte. So if that sounds expensive to you, it's because that's just the going rate for these drives. So give it a year or two and you'll get a much better deal. But if you are looking to expand right now, the wait is not gonna be that much longer. Moving on to our next news story, recently there was a pretty big patch for Destruction All-Stars where Lucid Games is making a lot of meaningful changes to the overall gameplay loop in this title and listening to player feedback to try and really address some of the issues that many have had since launch for the, you know, the small community that continues to play the game and they want to see it improve. So the change log here is that, well, first off, there's improved latency to avoid ghost hits. So this has been a problem since launch. Hopefully that's going to get better. Uh, the cooldown for slamming other vehicles has been reduced. There's new skins and cosmetics, online parties for solo game modes, a new quick play playlist. They're buffing all the all-stars and their hero vehicles, new all-star pass tiers, a refreshed shop interface, and two reworked mayhem maps with a smaller arena going live in a few weeks. So everything prior, I think, is uh, currently in the game right now, but in a few weeks, you'll have two smaller arena maps that um, reworked maps that will be available. So when you look at the smaller maps and the reduced cooldown, the buffs to all the hero vehicles, they are changing the gameplay loop in a way where they want people to be more engaged with actually slamming and, you know, trying to score points against other players because... I mean, when I played it at launch, I did like what was there, but it, it did feel like there were a lot of quiet moments just circling around the arena trying to find somebody to hit, and then not having any music was kind of stoic and, and weird, and maybe that didn't really help the, the air and the feeling of how the game was playing out, so... Um, you might want to jump back in and try it. There is still no music, which is a little strange to me still, but um, I like that Lucid Games is very committed, but again, their contract for the game probably isn't that long. Uh, I think it was a year minimum for a content pipeline, and I would like to see it go free to play. I would like to see them ship a PS4 version to give it some legs. I think it's got a lot of potential, but the writing on the wall is there, unfortunately. And so I, I hate to say it, but I would, uh, I'd would i like to think that they can get to a better spot in time, but I just, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Next up, Blue Box Game Studios' abandoned real-time experience application is now live on the PS5's PlayStation Store. So you can go download it, and, and that's it, really. You can't do much else, of course, because we do have to wait until August 10th for the first introduction trailer thing. We still don't know what that is, what it will be, what it will show us, but if you do start the application right now, you choose a language and then it just says check back soon. And if you go to Blue Box Game Studios' Twitter account, they sent out a teaser image where it shows some sort of blurry man in the background wearing an eye patch and there's text uh, on the upper level of the, the picture where that's blurred out as well and you know that's led a lot of people to theorize more about what it could mean and you know obviously it's a reference to to something and people are speculating more and I, I can't believe what this Twitter account's doing. I can't believe what the studio's doing. At this point, you're you're not gonna get any speculation from me because I'm I'm kind of over it, right? It's just uh there's so many wild theories still going on about what's what's up with the studio at this point. I mean, let's just wait, right? Because well, even I think once August 10th comes, that's still not really going to tell us anything. Um, if August 10th comes and they have something ready to to introduce us in the application. The whole thing is still very strange to me. Uh, but for now, we don't have much else outside of the, the trailer app now being live on PS5. Now, while we're talking about externally produced projects, we've got more updates here, like for example, Cana Bridge of Spirits. This one was unfortunately delayed. So not by much, just one month. It went from August to September 21st. And if the team needs more polish, I'm sure all of us can agree that's fine. If they need more polish, then, then so be it. Usually when we see these small delays of like one to two months, you know that they're already pretty close enough as is. So they should probably uh, hit September no problem. And I, I can't wait to try out that game. It still looks absolutely gorgeous just based off the background of that entire crew. Uh, but we learned about that. And then we also had the Annapurna Interactive Showcase. And this gave us a new trailer for Solar Ash, 
with a confirmed release date of October 26th. So shortly after Canterbury of Spirits, you'll also have Solar Ash coming out in October. And that game, I'm not too interested in Solar Ash, but it, it definitely looks pretty. If I have enough time, I'll jump into it. Uh, but the one game I'm really looking forward to is Stray. This was also in the Annapurna Interactive Showcase, and we got a gameplay demonstration about four minutes long. And uh, wow, I, I love the aesthetic of how this game looks. Of course, I'm... <laughs> you know more biased towards the fact that the cat is a you know we've got a protagonist as a, a full-on cat just walking around being a cat doing cat things they nailed the mannerisms so much uh, but it was expected that this is like a, a puzzle game an environmental puzzle game so you really are just uh, moving around the environment and solving puzzles but it looks like there is some um, some form of like combat and also like initially you're running away so you're kind of vulnerable at least initially but then you're going to pick up things to you know fight back and yeah I mean I'm I'm sold. I was sold to begin with, so that's a game where I'm lo really looking forward to it. That's slated for early 2022. So before that game did have a targeted release window of 2021, and that leaked release window of October and that uh, PlayStation 5 showcase trailer, which that was you know, months back. I think that was October for Stray. So that's why it was never confirmed because clearly they weren't sure if they were going to hit that in time. So this was a, a delay into early 2022 and we've got a lot of games getting pushed to early 2022. So if all these games hit within that first quarter or even second quarter, we've got a very packed uh, first half of the year, which really the whole year is looking, looking really good. Moving on to Ghost of Tsushima, Director's Cut. The Sucker Punch creative director, Nate Fox, was recently speaking with Push Square and was asked directly about why the Japanese lip sync is only available in the PS5 version and not the PS4 version. And the answer is actually pretty interesting, but completely plausible and makes sense on paper, which is, uh, it's actually the PS5's SSD. The problem here is that on PS4, uh, all the cutscenes are essentially pre-rendered and they're using that to load in all the chunks of, you know, whatever it is that they're loading behind the scenes, whereas on PS5, all the scenes are now, or all the cutscenes rather, are in real time. Everything is going to be loading instantaneously, and thus they can uh, ship more content on disc, which is what they're. That's basically their explanation here. Essentially, is that they were they couldn't even uh, they almost didn't get all the content on the PS4 disc with those pre-rendered scenes for English, and so that's why there's uh, only Japanese lip sync in the PS5 director's cut. Um, which again, this actually completely makes sense in theory. There's nothing to say why this wouldn't be the case. In fact, a lot of these uh, PS4 games, you know, they hardly do fit on that 50 something gigabyte standard Blu-ray disc. It's just, uh, well, my question would be, why can't we offer uh, something on the PS Store for free, which would be the Japanese lip sync, right? Just as an extra three, four, five gigabytes, however big it is to, to give that option to PS4 owners that decide to buy Director's Cut there because a lot of games actually do offer additional languages as a download on the PS Store. In fact, for PS5, there's chunked out versions of certain games and certain features where you can actually delete those parts of the game. So I'm not sure if this is something where they don't really want to go through the extra effort of doing that on PS4 because inherently, you know, the game is built around those pre-rendered scenes uh, or or maybe they are coming after the fact, I'm not entirely sure, but at least right now that is the reason. Uh, he was also asked about uh, Iki Island expansion, how long or how large is that island, and he basically compared it to the first act of Ghost of Tsushima, which if you played the game then you know that the first island is quite large. There's about you know 15, 20 hours of content there, so that might be comparable to what you can expect on Iki Island. So again, it depends on how quickly you get through the game, but it looks like there is a sizable amount there when it comes to this upcoming expansion for the director's cut. For our next news story, and unsurprising news, the Sony Interactive Entertainment president and CEO Jim Ryan uh, pretty much outright confirmed that the acquisition of Nixus Software was to help them in releasing more PC games. So, as part of an interview with Famitsu, who was quoted saying, We are also happy with our efforts to provide our IP to PCs, although it is still in its infancy, and we look forward to working with Nixus to help with that. Yeah, so when the acquisition was announced, it wasn't outright said as to what they were acquired for, but we all kind of, you know, we were picking up what Sony was laying down there. You can look at their portfolio and what they're most known for, and it's like, okay, obviously PC stuff because Sony's starting to do more of that. We even saw in the uh, investor relations meeting that Uncharted 4 is likely going to be the next uh, short-term PC release, but as Jim pointed out, it is in its infancy. They've only done, you know, two full-scale releases, and prior they had, uh, you know, some of those, you know, second-party games. They let those go to PC, you know, deals like Death Stranding where they agreed to do a PC version. 
um, all the Quantic Dream games and then prior to that some of those smaller games that they again they allowed to go to PC they are the IP holder they allowed all these things to happen so it's not going to happen overnight but uh, Uncharted 4 is likely the next project that Nixus is working on or maybe they were already contracted out prior and they're actively working on it and that's what sealed the deal for the you know the acquisition talk to start there we don't have the full timeline but this is pretty much uh, expected now another thing that was expected and we just talked about this as a rumor last week it turns out it was true the vg charts report about ps5's uh, estimated sales crossing over 10 million well just like i said i thought playstation would make a big deal about this on the ps blog and twitter and that's exactly what they did they crossed over 10 million it is confirmed ps5 has sold 10 million consoles worldwide despite all these hurdles uh, working against the console right the pandemic the chip shortage um, you know so much demand and they can't meet all that demand and the scalper issue which I know it's a big joke still keep in mind the vast majority of consoles are still actually getting sold to other customers right so every time you're trying to buy a ps5 I, I know it's a frustrating experience I can sympathize with you if you're still trying to buy one but you have to remember that you're fighting other people that want to buy and not just bots um, I believe the only figure that we have as a rough estimate at the most is like 10 to 15 percent of consoles between ps5 and series s x uh, ps5 digital edition i think it's you know anywhere from 10 to 15 percent were resold on you know craigslist ebay uh, facebook marketplace which is still a, a significant sum of consoles but most of them still go to regular everyday people but still um, as a confirmed number of 10 plus million i just i wish i could see what the number was if the demand was completely met and they were able to secure enough production to really you know sell as many as they possibly could uh, now Sony also put out some updated sales figures for their first party games and this is where we have more impressive numbers to look at here. Spider-Man Miles Morales sold 6.5 million copies across PS4 and PS5 and what's really eye-opening about that number is that yes this is a franchise that's going to do 10, 15 million plus copies over its lifetime but right now in this cross-gen period we can see in the marketplace uh, we don't have exact ratios all the time but we can see that next-gen versions are being favored consumers are really they're ready to buy next-gen consoles and next generation native games so out of that 6.5 million at least 3.25 is on ps5 or greater in all likelihood and that's a big chunk of the ps5 total install base ratchet and clank rift apart 1.1 million copies sold that's 10% of the PS5 install base. That's really insane for a Ratchet & Clank game. Um, MLB The Show 21, 2 million copies sold, the best in the franchise history. Although that is understandable, the game is now on Xbox. And uh, actually it sold 2 million, but it reached 4 million players. So the additional 2 million is from uh, Game Pass subscribers downloading it and trying it out, which uh, Jim Ryan was speaking with GameIndustry.biz and said it was an interesting experiment. It is their IP, so I mean, it's a game that they shipped on Xbox and they can, you know, they have that data, they have those numbers. Microsoft has to provide them, so I'm sure they'll look at those numbers holistically and who knows what they'll do with it, but still, that was a, a very successful launch. And then Returnal, 560,000 copies sold for this game as well. And I don't know how people are looking at that as bad. This is a game inherently where, you know, it's a, a big budget roguelite. Uh, it's not very, I mean, it's a difficult game. It's not very, um, friendly to a lot of newcomers right i mean it's that's five percent of the ps5 install base um i think some are maybe looking at these numbers and comparing it to the attach rate of nintendo hardware which that's not really accurate you have to remember that for playstation and xbox consoles where they they speak to more of a core audience of people that you know 70 80 percent of the time consumers are buying the next mad and the next battlefield the next call of duty you know big games like that every single year like annually on those consoles and then occasionally they'll pick up you know first party games uh, for Sony, at least if we line up PS5 ratios with PS4, they're about the same, if not a little bit higher on PS5, where, you know, some of those PS4 big budget games like Spider-Man, Horizon, Uncharted 4, God of War, those games that do 10 plus million copies, and that's roughly, you know, 10% of the install base, maybe a little bit more, and here we're seeing about the same or better. So this is actually quite good for Sony, especially because um, they've also confirmed that for PS5, this is the highest amount of monthly active users, um, the most amount of time, uh, the average amount of time spent on the console playing games. So, you know, just like every other fiscal report that we go over, the company is still doing really, really, really well. Uh, now, another sales milestone that we got separate from Sony earlier in the week from Kojima Productions was about Death Stranding. This is the first time we have a confirmed number for this game, 5 million copies sold across PS4 and PC which is about what I was expecting really. Uh, prior to the PC release, I always thought that maybe it was around like three, 3.5 million copies sold. 
never thought it was going to do like a lot, like 10 plus million. Um, now maybe Sony had some sort of target in place for 5 million or more. I mean, they had to have expectations on the fact that it's still going to be a, a game that's approached atypically. Um, you know, they were funding the thing, so they, they knew the process of it over time. It's just that, um, you know, the PC release I expected would do an, an additional 1.5, 2 million copies. Who knows what the ratio really looks like, but that's about what I expected. And I'm sure the director's cut will probably move an additional, you know, 250,000, maybe half a million copies in the short term. But we knew early on that the game, at the very minimum, made a profit and got Kojima Productions off the ground, which that's what the game was meant to do in the first place anyway, because it was his first game after leaving Konami. So that first game for Kojima, at least, was largely successful. And for Sony, I'm sure they're just pleased to know that the game you know, made a profit and they didn't lose anything on it. For our next news story, the former Sony Interactive Entertainment Chairman of Worldwide Studios, Sean Layden, who left the company in 2019, he has recently joined the Streamline Media Group's advisory board, which Streamline Media, they've been around since 2001, so 20-something years. Uh, they're trying to merge technology and media and entertainment and morph that into video game methodology, and they do a lot of contract work, QA, localization. They're across uh, three continents. They do a lot of remote work, and so uh, this is something that Sean was really excited about and wanting to be a part of. And as part of a conversation with GameIndustry.biz, he said a lot of very interesting things about the industry and the current state that it's in. And he delivered some pretty interesting quotes here, so we'll cover a few of them here. But he says, With each console generation, the cost of games goes up two times. So PS4 games were 100 to 150 million. So it stands to reason that PS5 games, when they hit their stride, will be in excess of $200 million. It's going to be very difficult for more than a handful of large players to compete in that space. During that time, we've also seen more consolidation. Consolidation is the enemy of diversity in many ways. It takes a lot of playing pieces off the table as they grow into these larger conglomerates. And again, we end up with this problem with diversity. Music on a revenue basis is probably one-fifth of the game space, but their cultural impact is 100 times what gaming is. Right now, we are narrowing ourselves down into genres and sequels and certain types of games. Favorites like my own, like Parappa and Vibribbon, those things don't seem to get a chance to come out on stage. That's bad for the industry and for fans. Over time, that leads to a crumbling of the games industry if we just keep talking to the same people and telling the same stories in the same way. And when it came to different delivery models like, say, subscription, Sean says, It's very hard to launch a $120 million game on a subscription service charging $9.99 a month. You pencil it out, you're going to have to have 500 million subscribers before you start to recoup your investment. That's why right now you need to take a loss-leading position to try to grow that base. But still, if you have only 250 million consoles out there, you're not going to get to half a billion subscribers. So how do you circle that square? Nobody has figured that out yet. So there's a lot more in that conversation, and I could easily do a completely separate topic talking about this, but we'll have to cut it a little bit short here. I don't want this show to be too long. Uh, what Sean's boiling this down to, and I mean, to preface the whole thing, he talks about how the console market has largely stayed in the same number of about 200 to 250 million consoles out there per cycle, per generation, um, which is true, actually. For, for the last how many generations now, we've seen that we've been stuck in about a 250 million console total install base between all the platform holders. And so despite the fact that games are generating more money, you've got the same amount of customers, basically. Um, they're just willing to spend more money nowadays. And that kind of goes back to all the metrics we've been talking about for a long time, where people are spending more time playing games, they're buying more games, there's DLC, there's, there's microtransactions, there's uh, more ways to monetize the existing customers. But what Sean's getting at is trying to reach just more people inherently. And how do you do that outside of uh, all this heavy consolidation and trying to bolster you know, a subscription service where you know that's going to be problematic too. That's always been something that's been discussed for a while now when it came to you know, we just talked about this in the Tuesday video about how Game Pass's strategy is loss-leading. They are, without a doubt, spending some serious cash to gain a lot of subscribers over time. And uh, But that's the, uh, the caveat here is that Microsoft is trying to reach uh, customers outside of the console space, right, with things like Xbox Cloud Gaming. They want you to subscribe for $10 a month on a mobile phone and play you know, these high-quality, big-budget games that way, where a phone typically wouldn't see those, those kinds of games. Um, but Sean's arguing here that um, you've got 250 million customers that are willing to buy consoles for those types of experiences. It doesn't necessarily mean you can step outside of the 250 million just because you offer the game on a, on a subscription service and offer it to you know, mobile phone users. It's a matter of 
you know, how do we create different experiences and how do we, uh, you know, step out of our comfort zone of what has largely been, you know, Western developed games for a long time now. Um, so that's kind of what he's getting at for the most part. I don't want to um, paraphrase the entire conversation. Again, this is a story where we could easily spend more time talking about this, but it is an interesting angle to look at it. There's so many delivery mechanisms going on and all the platform holders and even publishers are trying to figure out how can they reach more customers because that has been a problem for the longest time for these uh, for these companies. They are extracting more money out of the same customers over a 20 year period. They want to reach more and that's why Sony's doing things like PC releases or um, they're starting a mobile phone division to specialize in mobile phone games. Um, and this might give us some serious undertones as to why Sean Layden decided to you know, leave the company if there was some sort of um, you know, internal conflict of how they wanted to start spending the money that the Sony group was offering to the PlayStation division when it came to should we do more merger and acquisition, investing in our own studios, uh, investing in outside developers, uh, startups, uh, or doing different projects that we otherwise wouldn't have taken a risk on before, should we uh, make more investment in... China, Malaysia, or you know these these other territories, which to Sony's credit a little bit, they are trying to do, but maybe Sean wanted to get more aggressive in those areas and uh, maybe tone down the approach of first party, where they are you know these games are in excess of a hundred million dollars, and that was something Sean talked about in uh, game during Games Lab uh, 2019, where he, he openly said you know these games are they're costing too much. We need to do. Um, we need to do lower budget games and release them more frequently for a more sustainable uh, industry. So really fascinating talk. I wish we could dive more into it, but for now, we'll leave it there. Now, with all that out of the way, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories that I want to talk about with you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was PS Now versus Game Pass, a uh, deep dive comparison. It's been a while since we did something like that where we really you know, evaluate what's going on between the two companies. And so for that, uh, we look at the library of games, quality of games, company prospects, how they're similar, how they're not similar. Uh, go check that out. And as always, we've got another upload planned for this coming Tuesday. Uh, but that is it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Bernanke. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.